John chapter number 14. I'm going to read verse number 23. That's where we're going to start. Jesus answered and said unto him, being uh, Judas, not Judas Iscariot, Jude. You go over in your Bible, you're going to study out one book of Acts. You'll find the future Acts of the Apostles, but study out all those that Jesus called to be his disciples. You're going to find out that there was more than one named Jude which is why your Bible in verse number 22 said, Judas saith unto him, not Iscariot. In other words, this ain't the one that betrayed him. This is the one that stuck with him. Okay. But Jesus answered and said unto him, If a man love me, he will keep my words, and my father will love him, and we will come unto him and make our abode with him. He that loveth me not keepeth not my sayings, and the words which ye hear, which ye hear is not mine, but the father's which sent me. These things have I spoken unto you, being yet present with you. Stop reading there for sake of time. But Jesus fixing to head to Mount Calvary in a very short time where we're at right here. The chapter before this, we don't have time to get into it. But go read the chapter before this. When Brother Doug talks about it, he wants to give you the context of what's going on when he's preaching. A good way to find context, you read the chapter before you read the chapter you in, and you read the chapter after. And then if you need more context, you go back in either direction until you figure out timeline-wise where you're at. So you can understand what's going on. Okay, I don't have time to get into all of it today. Or we'll be here till next Sunday. Okay, But Jesus here, talking to Judas, not Iscariot, and the rest of the disciples, Judas asked him, How is it that thou wilt manifest thyself unto us and not unto the world? Jesus is talking in those things that only at this point Jesus understood. Before that, verse number 21, Jesus said, He that hath my commandments and keep them, he is that loveth me, and he that loveth me is shall be loved of my Father, and I will love him and will manifest myself to him. Jude's asking him and saying, Well, Lord, how is it that thou wilt manifest thyself unto us? and not unto the world. In other words, Judas is saying, Lord, we love you. We keep your commandments. So how is it that you can be manifest only unto us, but not the world? He says, if I can see you, the rest of the world can see you. Jesus isn't talking about a physical manifestation. Jesus is talking in terms, after where we stopped reading, verse number 26, he says, but the capital C comforter, right, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name. He's saying one of these days, right, we now know that it was on the day of Pentecost, that the Holy Ghost came down and dwelt in men that had been saved. Right? And then through the book of Acts, salvation and the receiving of the Holy Ghost happened different ways. But by the time you get about 15 chapters into the book, the people in the book of Acts got saved like we do. They got saved and then the Holy Ghost sealed them immediately. Right? There was no more laying on of hands or you had to breathe on somebody. Hallelujah. Some of y'all need some altoids. Right? I don't want y'all breathing on me. But, and some of y'all don't use hand sanitizer. I don't want y'all laying hands on me either. Right? That's why I can't shake Brother Bob's hand half the time because by the time I get to him, after I get out of the treasury, he's already washed his hands. He's got the germs off. He don't want mine added back onto it. So, we, I bump him with an elbow or something. But, Jesus is talking about the manifestation of the Comforter. Okay, verse number 26 told us that the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, okay, whom the Father will send in Jesus' name. Why did the Comforter come? Because Jesus said, before he ascended up into heaven, that it was more benefit, it was needful for him to go. He said, if he didn't go, the Comforter couldn't come. Jesus said the Holy Ghost was better for the Holy Ghost to come than for Jesus to stay on the world. That's not my words. That's Jesus' words. He said, I must go away so that the Comforter can come. But the Comforter being the Holy Ghost, we know if you've heard any preaching from our pastor on the Holy Ghost, Holy Ghost 
is not about himself. He is about bringing attention to the Son. And the Father is the one that sent him for the express purpose. He says here in verse number 26 that the Holy Ghost sent in Jesus' name shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I've said unto you. The Holy Ghost came so that the witness and the testimony of what Christ did was not lost. Keep in mind, those, these fellas that he's talking to in this group, after Jesus went away, they had apostolic powers. They could heal people. Right? They could touch them, like, give them sight. Right? They could do miracles, speak in tongues. They could speak in Hebrew or Greek or whatever language they want to use. Whatever their natural tongue was, they could talk in that, but whoever was listening would hear it in their language. They didn't get up there and go, and then all, you know, everybody understood what that meant. That's not speaking in tongues. It's a bunch of nonsense. God's not the author of confusion. It'd be the same thing as if you dropped me off in the middle of Russia, and I spoke hillbilly, and they understood it in, you know, polar bear, because that's what they speak over in Russia. But a lot of times, go and find where the Apostle Paul's preaching out in the middle of a marketplace, and you'll find that there wasn't just, you know, Jews or Greeks. A lot of times he had a whole bunch, he went to all of minor Asia. You know how many different cultural groups are across where the Apostle Paul traveled? How many different native languages they used in those places? You know, Assyrian, Old Syriac, how many other? He would talk in Hebrew or in Greek because that's what he was raised with and they would hear it in their natural language that wasn't something that he was able to do on his own no that was a manifestation of the Holy Ghost the Holy Ghost did that work but what Jesus is saying I'm going to go away and make myself manifest unto a group of people and Jude says well Lord how can you make yourself manifest to some but not all obviously Jude hadn't been paying attention if you remember last week I don't know what happened I wasn't there but there's times when there's a whole multitude around him and all of a sudden a bunch of them would take up stones to try and stone him and then the Bible says that he'd hit himself and he'd walk right through the crowd that, well obviously Jude he's able to be in a place and not reveal himself to people because he walked out of a, he walked out of the Super Bowl without nobody noticing that he walked out of a packed coliseum where they were shoulder to shoulder packed all the way around him and yet he still got out without anybody seeing him. I mean just a few days after this they're going to be boarded up in a house and he's just going to show up in the middle of it. That he's not limited by, you know, Graydon, we ask dumber questions to God than this. But there, he's just said, if you appear to us, how are you not going to appear to other people? Then the answer Jesus gives he says, if a man love me, he will keep my words, and my Father will love him, and we will come unto him, and make our abode with him. He didn't say, I will come unto you. He said, we. Who? The Holy Ghost and the one that the Holy Ghost came to tell you about. Okay, that's what we find out in verse number 26. But then, verse number 25, he says, these things have I spoken unto you, being yet present with you. He's not just talking about this lesson that he's talking about. He's talking about everything that he told them at the Last Supper, everything that he told on the, you know, from the Sermon on the Mount to you know, when he went down there to the river and John baptized him and he began his earthly ministry. He's saying, everything that I've told unto you, verse number 26, he says, He, the Holy Ghost, shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. So Jesus is telling them when we referring to himself as part of the Godhead they saying when the Holy Ghost comes the Holy Ghost is going to bring unto your remembrance everything that I said. Everything that I said then and he's going to start telling you some new. He's going to tell you to write some letters, some epistles and to pen those words down. Right? But really you go study the epistles you know what they're doing they're just telling you what Jesus said. You know those that wrote something that Jesus didn't say? You know who told it to him? Jesus. Where'd John get the book of Revelation? He's caught up into heaven. He stood before one who had eyes as fire, hair as white as wool. He says, I am. He says, I'm him. Who? Jesus. 
Uh, the Apostle Paul, we find out later, he says he, a bunch of years before that, he didn't know whether it was in spirit or in the body, but he's called up into the third heaven. He saw things he's scared to even talk about, let alone write down and, you know, pen, he said those were things that God showed me. So where do you think he got everything else that he wrote down? God. So Jesus is talking about, in these verses, the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Jesus talked about you could tear down the tabernacle in three days and he'd rebuild it. They thought he was talking about the temple. And he said, oh no. Not talking about a building, talking about this stuff. The body. Jesus said, you can tear up this body, but in three days I'll make it just like it was beforehand. But the reason Jesus did that was to go away. He died on the cross then three days and three nights he did what only Jesus could do then he took the blood took it on to heaven the Bible says he led captivity captive all them Old Testament saints went with them and he went up to heaven he put that blood on the mercy seat and we find that he makes some more appearances in between then and when he said you know hey this is the last time I'm going and pastor preached on not too many weeks ago where the angels just standing there well what's he doing or the crowd's standing there looking up into heaven and the angels say, hey, what y'all doing? He gone. Go do what he told you to do. Then you go find that they said, well, he said that the comforter was going to come and then you find them praying in the upper room. And what they do? They prayed that the Holy Ghost come and then when the Holy Ghost came, what happened? According to the book of Acts, they turned the world upside down. That wasn't their testimony. That was the testimony of those that put them on trial. Said these are the men that turned the world upside down. Why did all that happen? Because Jesus' promise here in this chapter, right? he says, verse number 26, that the Comforter, whom the Father will send in my name, shall teach you all things and bring all things into your remembrance whatsoever I said unto you. How does the Holy Ghost do that? Well, because, verse number 23, Jesus answered and said unto him, If a man love me, he will keep my words, and my Father will love him, and we will come unto him, and make our abode with him. You want to know why the Holy Ghost can bring things to your remembrance even though you've never heard his audible voice? Or even though you've never seen his hand right on a wall what it is that God wanted you to know? It's because he came to you and he made an abode with you and in you. We are sealed with the Holy Ghost. Meaning, God put the seal on it. Y'all remember, or you ever seen them old wax stamp seals? that you'd write an old-timey letter and you'd fold up a piece of paper around the letter that you wrote, you'd pour out hot wax and you'd stamp it and it had a seal in it. That seal lets you know who put it there. And depending on whose seal, usually there's more than one seal because it would be whoever sent it and then there'd be two witnesses. And they'd say, we saw them seal this thing up and we know what they put in it if there was something valuable. Uh, well, when you got saved, God turned your soul from dead in trespasses and sin into alive in that new creature, and he sealed it so that it couldn't sin anymore. And what the son did was he came down, and he put a stamp on it, and he said, Father, we bought it. And then the father said, well, if you bought it, that means that I own it. And then the Holy Ghost said, and since you guys own it, right, I'm going to come down here and keep an eye on what we bought. I'm going to live with it. And there's three seals on your soul testifying to the fact that God sealed it and only God can open it. Keep in mind, you can go to the book of Revelation. There's a book with seven seals on it. Your soul's got three of them on it. The only person that can pop them seals is the one that put it on there, God. You know who only could loose those seals on that book? It was the Lamb. Jesus. Jesus. All the heavens started erupting when the Lamb made himself known. Why? Because they knew that he was there to open them seals. They knew that if the seals couldn't be opened, that the book of life wouldn't have been opened, and there would have been no record of who had trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ. Right? That's a whole lot of symbolism for the things that Jesus did for you in order for your name to be written in that book. But when he wrote it down, he sealed you with three testaments. The Father said, I sent Jesus. 
So if you believe on Him, you believe on the one that sent Him. That's what Jesus taught. He says, if you believe me, you don't believe me. You believe the words of the one that sent me. Because His words were the words of the one that sent Him, the Father. To believe on Christ is to believe God the Father. Right? But to believe on Christ also is to accept that He was the perfect Lamb of God. That He was the Son of God. That He is and always will be, always was Christ. Right? The Redeemer of fallen man, but also the King of kings and Lord of lords. But then you've got the Holy Ghost. Right? A lot of people don't like talking about the Holy Ghost. Really, you could talk about the Holy Ghost and the things that the Holy Ghost does, but you don't know that much about the Holy Ghost. Because this book wasn't written to tell you about the Holy Ghost. This book tells you about the Father. And the Son came to tell you what the Father wanted you to hear. And the Holy Ghost came because the Son and the Father both promised that He was going to come. And He does do very many important things regarding your salvation and then afterwards your spirituality. Your prayers wouldn't make it to heaven without the Holy Ghost. When you read your Bible every day, you wouldn't get anything out of it without the Holy Ghost. The Bible says that the word is spiritually discerned. Your spirit was dead in trespasses and sins. It didn't know nothing about the Word of God. Right? The Bible says that faith cometh by hearing. How shall they hear without a preacher? The preacher is the one that preached the Word but you know who took it and applied to your heart and let you know that you was a sinner? The Holy Ghost. No man cometh unto the Father except I draw him. Who do you think is doing the drawing? The Holy Ghost. Right? But after you get saved, when you sit down and read this book, your spirit may be saved on its way to heaven, but the only reason that you get something out of it is because the God who wrote it is still speaking to you through the Holy Ghost. Otherwise, this would just be another book. It'd just be something that was pinned down and it was the opinions of man. No, this was Holy Ghost breathed and to this day it's still alive because of the Holy Ghost. Well, don't know how we got off on all that, but y'all welcome. That wasn't, most of that wasn't in the notes. But Holy Ghost came to seal you. Okay. But twice, Jesus, verse number 23, ain't in 21. He says the same thing, but he says it two different ways. Right now, this may just be me. But see, God, very detail-oriented God. God promised that he knows the number of hairs that are on top of your head. That's how much he cares about the details in your life. But God, according to your Bible, calls all the stars by name. They keep sending up more satellites and, you know, telescopes and all these different readers. And you know what they keep finding? There's more of them out there than they thought. They keep finding more and more. And God says, yeah, I know it was there because I, I named it. Not only did I make it, I gave it a name. And I know each and every one of them. Now, God's very detail-oriented. So if Jesus says something twice, two verses apart, but there's a little bit different between them. Don't you think there's a reason? Because he wanted you to see something that otherwise you'd have missed. Right, well, verse number 21, he says, He that hath my commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me. Well, verse number 23, he says, Jesus answered and saying to them, If a man love me, he will keep my words. Well, what are Jesus' words? His commandments. What are his commandments? The words that God told him to speak that God the Father told him to speak. Well, what's it say about the person that loves Jesus? Well, verse number 21 says that he hath the commandments and keepeth them. That's somebody that loves Jesus. Now see, if you've got a 1611 KJV, you have the commandments. But it's not enough to have them. He says, and keepeth them. One... I believe that that means to preserve them. Talking about perpetuity of the church. God's the one that founded this church. God's the one that's going to keep the church going if he doesn't 
sing Christ back and rapture church out. It's not going to be because of us. It's not going to be because of a certain preacher. It's not going to be because of how much you gave in an offer play. It's going to be because God promised that there was always going to be a church. But if he so chooses to use us as instruments and vessels to be a part of that plan, hallelujah, I want to be hitched up to it. But it's not because of us. It's because God and the perpetuity of the church depends on him, not me. But I do believe that those that have the commandments of God, part of what he's saying is, if you love them, you'll keep them in and you'll preserve them. They're going to be true whether you tell any, anybody about them or not. They're going to be true whether you instill those principles into your youngins or your grandkids or your nieces and nephews. It, they're still true. But he told you to keep them. You do realize that the reason you have this book today is that for thousands of, well, for about 1,400 years, 1,400 and probably 50, I can't remember the exact date. But in order for you to get a copy of the Bible back then, it had to be copied, letter by letter, reviewed line by line in triplicate to make sure that there were no errors between what the original line was and what the new one is. And then... It had to be translated by 1611 out of six different other languages for you to get it in English. And the review and the meticulous process of making sure that, yeah, that in Hebrew means that in English, and we all agree on it. But there was a lot that went into you just to have them. But hand on it, they'd say, I think I heard one time, that if a man was a scribe, and he was copying out the Bible and he followed Jewish ordinance that he had to do it one line at a time and before he could move on to the next, three other guys had to sign off and agree that, yep, that line is the exact same as that line. That if he did that every day for his entire life and they followed the right procedures, he might get 30 copies of the Bible done in his life. That were very expensive, very precious. But today, it's just as precious, except about 1450, this guy named Gutenberg found out how to take a piece of paper, stick it to a thing, and then roll some ink on some letters that he could rearrange, and he made a printing press. And that sped it up. But even then, once you get, let's say you make 500 copies of this page of the book of John, guess what? You got to rearrange all them letters again for the next page in chapter number 15. And then you had to run 500 more copies of it. Then after it, you had to bind it. Back then, they bound it with either wood on the front or, you know, real hard material. And then on the inside, there'd be like an animal skin as the inner cover. And then they'd have to hand bind all them pages. Right? Back then, Bibles were big because that's how big they had to make them because they had to make it by hand. Nowadays, we get machines and you can get it down to this. You can get it down to actually less than this because this has got commentaries and an index and concordance, like miniature ones in the back of it. You can get it a whole lot smaller nowadays. In fact, my last preacher Bible is about that big. Now, they got ones you could just slide in your pocket. Now, because of machinery and advancement, but when Jesus says that keepeth my commandments, he's not just talking about you keeping them in your life. He's talking about preserving them. If you love God, you're concerned that the next generation is going to learn it the same way that you did. Even if you're the one that has to do it, you're going to be the one that teaches them the difference between what God says and what the world thinks. Because what God said hadn't changed no matter how much the world wants it to change. So when it says to keep His command, that means preserve them. Go look at Israel. Throughout the history in the Old Testament. You know when they got in trouble? When the old generation started departing and they didn't keep the commandments for the next generation. They didn't hand it down and say, this is what God expects from you. You know why God gave us the commandments? To prove to us that we weren't perfect and we needed a Savior. You know why He gave you commandments after you got saved? Because that's what He expects out of you because you were bought with a price. You don't get to live the way that you want to live. You get to live the way that the Almighty tells you to live. Not because He's an evil taskmaster, but because He loves you. Look, verse number 21. And he that loveth me shall be loved of the Father. Look at verse number 23. If any man love me, he will keep my words, and my Father will love him. Twice in two verses, Jesus promised. If you keep the commandments of Jesus, because really, we've already talked about it, 
They weren't Jesus' commandments. They were God the Father's commandments, and Jesus spoke them unto you the same way that the Father spoke it unto him. That's why he said that he called us his friends, because he kept nothing hidden that the Father had shown unto him. He told us everything that the Father told him to do. That's why as soon as the Father in heaven says, go get the church, Jesus is doing it. Because the Father told him to do it. And he does everything under the perfect will of the Father. Well, twice Jesus just said that if you keep his commandments, and in one verse he says if you have them and keep them, because you love Jesus, that the Father is going to love you. Now see, some people would call that a contradiction in the Bible. Because your Bible says that God loved you with an everlasting love. Your Bible says that God is love. Your Bible says that God knew you before he formed you in the belly. And that long before you were ever born, there was a number put on your head by God for how long you was going to live on this earth. And God knew every event from the time you took your first breath until the time that you take your last God orchestrated your life and events in your life so that you could come to a place to where you're sitting here today. Right? God knew the day that you was going to get saved before you got saved. That's not predestination. That's just God knowing everything. He knows all. He, but He knew what He predestined was there's going to be a chance for you to make a choice. The choice was up to you, but because He's God, He knew you was going to say yes if you got saved. You want to know how I believe that so much, Sister Billy? Because if God knew how many people were going to die and go to hell, he would have made it the size that it needed to be originally. But your Bible says that hell enlarges its borders every day. God has to make more room for people to die and go to hell because he didn't want them to go there. It's why I believe that in the latter days there's going to be more earthquakes and volcanoes erupted because God's stretching the inside of this planet to make more room for all the people and the earth's starting to crack and give. You can say, well, Brother Jordan, that's a fine chapter and verse on that. I know that one day he's going to give a key to an angel and it's going to open up the bottomless pit and there's going to smoke come out of it. I know hell's pretty close to the surface because an angel's going to be able to reach down and unlock the door. And in the Great tribulation, there's a whole bunch of nastiness coming out of that pit that's going to wreak havoc on this world. So I know it's close enough. It's within walking distance for some demons. I know it's within throwing distance because Jesus is going to chain him and throw him back in there for a thousand years. And then at the end of it, Satan's going to be loose for one more time. What are you saying, Brother Jordan? I'm saying God has always loved you. But this isn't talking about a love as in God loved you from a salvation standpoint. God loved his creation because he created his image, or his, he created his creation in his image. God looked at us and saw what we were supposed to be, and that's why he loved us. We don't understand that because we just see what we were. We saw where we were, and we don't understand how God could have loved us then or now. But yet, God promised you that he did and that he always would. But see this, different. Somebody can love you, and you can love somebody else. But that doesn't mean that you're in a position to either receive or enjoy that love. If I bought Christian a Christmas present and told him, hey, I want you to come over at this time, or I want to meet at this restaurant at this day, at this time, and we're going to exchange gifts. Well, if he don't show up, he ain't getting the gift that day. Because I love him, I got him one. But I didn't love him enough to wrap it. Mama did that. Right? It came in its own box. Why does it need to be wrapped? It's already a secret. Right? The wrapping paper is just more of a barrier to him. Get, I want him to get it so bad, I wanted to give it to him like two months ago when I got it for him. Right? Wrapping paper, that's just... I need to get him back because one year he got me like... a two gift cards and he wrapped it in like 900 feet of saran wrap and he put tape and he did all these different layers. It took me 12 hours to get it and I couldn't cut it open because he told me it was fragile. It wasn't fragile. He just wanted me to suffer. Right? But somebody gets you a gift and there's a time arrangement. 
hey, I understand things happen, right? Sorry you couldn't make it. You want me to bring your carry out? No, I can't. I had to go into work, okay? Nick, give me a time and date. Well, if he never gives me a time and date, he's never getting that present. It's not because I don't want him to have it. It's not because I didn't intend for him to have it. It's not because he doesn't want it. It's just that we can't get to the spot where we can swap off. But if you love the Lord, according to John 14, 21 and 23, you'll keep his commandments as in walking in his commandments. But if you walk in his commandments, Jesus promised twice that God the Father will love you. That's not talking about with the love that it took for him to send the Savior or the love that it was that drew you to Calvary. No, that was the love of the Savior. Here, Jesus is promising that the Father will love you. That's the love that a father has for their child. You walk in Jesus' commandment, every day is going to be a new outpouring of the Father's love for one that was obedient to his son. Because you're a joint heir to the throne. You're just as much his son if you've been saved as Jesus is. Joint heir to the king is the way the Bible puts it. Everything he owns, I own. In the eyes of God, there's no difference between me and him. That's why he wrote me in his righteousness. Because until I get a body like his, Jesus wants me to look like him in the eyes of the Father. And you know what the Father expects his child to do? You know what? He expects me to do the same thing. He expects Jesus to do. Or Jesus to do. Which was what? The will of the Father. What was the will of the Father? Those things that Jesus spoke as commandments. Jesus kept them and delivered them unto us. What's he expect me to do? Keep them. To live them and deliver them to the next group of people that need to hear them. So when God sees me robed in the righteousness of his son, he knows that his son would be right smack dab in the middle of his will. And when he looks down and he sees that his son's in the smack dab middle of his will, he can't help but love him. Right, that's the kind of love that Brother Luther Spive is talking about. You know, it's, he can't help it, he's just that way. You think that you can't take no more and he just pulls out another handful on purpose. Stacks it on top. I've told you over in Psalms where it says daily he loadeth us with benefits. Loadeth, it means that God blesses you so good that if God blessed you anymore it might kill you. That's what I honestly believe. He loadeth you with benefits. God gave you so much when you got saved that you still this side of heaven aren't going to be able to understand all that you got. Because there's some things that only God understands about what he did for you. But trust me, when you figure out what it is on the other side that he did, you're going to be thankful for it. But what are you saying, Brother George? I'm saying this is something different than just the love of the Savior. Because Jesus has already told them that he's loved them. That was the love of the Son, the love of the Savior. The love of one seeking to save that which was lost. But here he says, if you keep my commandments, the Father will love you. What's that? That's the love of the patriarch of the family. I mean, the Bible talks about how if you as earthly parents right, love when your children keep your commandments. And if you being earthly parents want to give good gifts unto your children how much more does our heavenly father one expect us to keep his commandments but also pours out love when we do keep the commandments and he desires to give you gifts that you can't even wrap your head around why do you think that he promised that if you come and ask him he'll show you great and mighty things which you know it's not he's saying you got no idea what's up this side of glory he promised that if you gave to the poor, but that he'd open up the storeholds of heaven and pour it out on you. He promised that if you do your tithe, because it already belongs to God, if you're just uh, obedient and giving it unto God and respecting that, Lord, this is yours. He said, see if he won't open the windows of heaven, pour out something on you. He said, if you give unto the poor, it's as if you've been... You're given a loan unto God. That's how he treated You think God's not going to pay it back with interest? Right? You're lucky to get a good interest rate out of a bank. Can you imagine what God's interest rate is? When he says, just give it to me and I'll give it back. By how much? It may be 10, maybe 100, maybe 20. 
But I promise it's going to be good. But he said, God loves you, but sometimes you're not in the right spot for God to pour out that love. Sometimes you may not be in the right spot physically. But we heard it preached not too long ago. <laughs> you can go out fishing on a boat every Sunday, and you can take your Bible with you. It doesn't mean Jesus is going to be on the other end of the boat with you. Right now, if you went on vacation, you on vacation. Jesus took his disciples and they went away to a desert place to rest. I believe it's scriptural for you to get away, to recharge. Get away from all this crazy and all the crazies in here. Right? Just say, hey, I just need to relax. I'm weird. If I go on vacation, I don't want to do anything. Vacation is time to get rested, not more wore out than when I went. I'm not coming back with more bags under my eyes. I'm coming back with less. Right? And don't stress me. If I go do something with you, don't stress. Well, we got to go do it. You go do it. No, I'm going to sit here. Because none of that appeals to me. I'm on vacation. I'm doing what I want to do. What I want to do is sit in air conditioning, watch things that make me laugh, and then sleep. Okay? I'm fine with eating the same food that we had back home. That, but if you're offering, yeah, I'll take a whole bunch of seafood that I normally don't eat. That there's a difference between being positioned right, and then being placed in the right spot, being where you're supposed to be, but then you may be physically in the right spot, but spiritually you ain't got the cover of your vessel taken off. You've come in thinking, well, I've got everything that God wants me to have inside of this vessel that he's given me. No, you're supposed to be the vessel. God didn't give you a vessel. He made you into a vessel of honor for his honor and his glory. You know what you're supposed to do when you get filled up? You're supposed to pour it out. Because we get to come on back to the well. They don't have a well. How shall they hear without a preacher? How shall they hear unless someone goes and gives them a taste so that they can see that the Lord is good? Jesus asked the Samaritan woman at the well to give me drink. She said, you being a Jew, ask me for a drink? What she didn't understand is, is he was getting ready to say, hey, this is all just going to be a metaphor for a second on what really is going to happen if you get a taste of living water. But he got her attention. She saw him. She knew he was, she wasn't going to talk to him. She wasn't going to look him in the eyes. She was going to avoid him at every turn because she knew that's what most Jews expected. You know what he said? He, had, he just asked her the simplest thing that he could. In fact, it was custom at that time that if there was a stranger, you would offer before you drew your own water. He just asked her, you can give me a drink of that. She says, why in the world are you talking to me? I'm the lowest of the low. My own people make me come draw water in the middle of the day because the other ladies can't even stand to be around me. They don't socialize with me because they're afraid that it'll make other people think that they're into what I was into. Jesus says, oh, I know. Told her all the deeds of her life. She came that day, but spiritually her water pot had a lid on it. She wasn't ready to get filled up. She asked a bunch of questions. That was good questions too. But Clint taught on them one time. When I went on vacation, he talked about what the woman at the well said when she said, we worship in the mountains. She says, one people say do it this way, another people say do it that way. You know what she's saying? I've got all I need. But tell me if I'm wrong. She says, I believe you know the difference. And he says, oh yeah, I know. He says, when the Christ comes, and she goes, well, who is he and when's he getting here? She says, Bingo. And then she said, give me a drink. And he said, you still don't get it. Because she was thinking he's going to give her a cup of water and it's a miracle. Like that woman with the cruise of oil, she thought her water pot, she's going to pull in there and she's going to have water all the time. He's saying, we ain't talking about a cup of water. He says, we're talking about a drink that you need spiritually. You know how I know she got it? 
Because she went and told everybody that she knew in the town. The people that 10 minutes ago she wouldn't have talked to because they was afraid that they'd, you know, stone her for the life that she had had. She was going and she was telling everybody. She didn't care who it was. Didn't care what they thought about her. Hey, come see a man which told me everything I ever did. She said, y'all don't even know everything that I ever did. But he told me everything. And guess what? Oh, by the way, he just so happens to be Christ. What happened says that the whole town came out to see. You know what happened? She decided that she needed to get a drink. She took the lid off of her pot. And you've heard our pastor preach it. She left her water pot. Because she went out and she had hers filled with a drink of the living water. She wasn't worried about water no more. She met the master of the seas. He got plenty of water. Just because you're in the right place don't mean that you're positioned. Well, what are you saying, Brother Jordan? I'm saying we went through all of that just to get down here. End of verse number 21. It says, and I will love him. He will be loved to the Father, and I will love him, and will manifest myself to him. And then verse number 23, it says, and we will come unto him and make our abode with him. You know what that word manifest means? It means reveal. Every now and then the Holy Ghost manifests His presence. We know He's always here, but every now and then He just shows out. He says, I'll do the preaching tonight. There He says, because of that song, He says, I'm going to get to pulling on some heartstrings. People are just going to talk about how good God is, and we all just going to appreciate and enjoy the fact that God showed out a little bit because He inhabits the praise of His people. That manifestation is because of sin, these eyes don't see everything that Adam and Eve originally saw. Adam could look up into heaven and he didn't see just stars and skies and moon and clouds. He could see past that. But where was it? I don't know. But it's close enough that Jesus can roll back and step out and then he's here to call us up. I believe it's just right there on the other side of, you know, somewhere. But it's close enough that when he comes one day, He's going to roll back and the whole world's going to be able to see his face. How close is he? Well, he's close enough that he can still reach out and touch the heart. He's still close enough that when you're so down low that he can reach and lift you up. I don't think he's somewhere up billions and trillions. And No, I believe God's just as close as you want him to be. He says, show me chapter and verse on that. Draw nigh to him, he draw nigh to you. That's not metaphorical. I believe it, really. Because he's omnipresent. That means he's everywhere at once. When you draw nigh to him, guess where he's at? He's right there next to you. As close as you get to God, he's just as close, heading in the same direction. But he says, verse number 21, that he will manifest myself to him. Verse number 23 says, and we will come unto him. What's that? That's called manifestation. God's everywhere at once, but every now and then God just shows out. Well, he's saying we're going to show out personally, privately. That's that spiritual relationship. When you get in the Word, he just manifests and says, hey, this is what you need for the day. You know that thing you was praying about for about two weeks? Guess what? Here's the answer over here in this verse. Some just jump off the page. Or, he already promised down in verse number 26 that the Comforter would bring unto your remembrance the things that he said. When you're out there in the world and somebody asks you a question and you're like, I know there's a Bible verse and all of a sudden it's right there, Holy Ghost did that. That's just Him manifesting. That's Him doing what God promised that He would do. All those times that something comes up and deep down in here it either says, hey, you might not all do that. I wouldn't go down that road. Or it says, hey, take that path. Or it says, you know what? There's something weird about that guy. And it's not your brain thinking, that guy dresses weird, right? Or that guy talks funny. No, it's something down here that says, that guy's got a different spirit than what I got. I got a feeling that that might be a wolf in sheep's clothing. And it's not your opinion. It's something that from down here it's speaking. You know what that is? That's a manifestation. God just stepping out for a second to say, hey, I love you. And because I love you, that's the way you need to go. Don't hang out with that guy. And oh, by the way, you're going to need a little meal. But well, that little meal that Elijah got lasted 40 days. 
right? Love you. Here's a little morsel. But well, a morsel from the master's table is a whole lot better than a banquet that the world can give you. Well, then he says in verse number 23, and make our abode with him. Now Jesus, he already promised. Go back to the beginning of this verse, or beginning of this chapter. That night, you, your heart be troubled. You believe in God, you believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself. That where he is, there ye may be there also. He's saying, there's a place that I'm going to. He says, that's, what's he call it? In my father's house, that's home. But a home isn't an abode. A home is a permanent place. An abode is temporary. Remember how we talked about God being detail-oriented? Jesus said in verse number 23, and will come unto him. Jesus said, home is where I'm coming to get you, and we're going to where I'm at. Here he says that we, talking about God, are going to come unto him. That's where he's at right now, not where he's going to be. When we go home, Jesus is taking us to him. But here it promises that if you love him and you keep his commandments, that he's coming to you. That's a promise now. That's not a promise for all of eternity. He already said, don't let your heart be troubled. Where he's going, he's going to take us one day. It'll all be fine. But he says that if you love him and keep his commandments, that he's coming to you. And it says, and we right, make our abode with him. Who does he talk about? The Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. You are a tabernacle for the Holy Ghost to indwell. But you know what the tabernacle was meant for? For offering sacrifices up unto God? Well, that's already been paid. Blood's been applied. But the sacrifice for sin was applied to my life. That's why I am the tabernacle that I am. But you know what the other purpose of the tabernacle was? Praise and worship unto God. What happened every now and then when they'd get a, you know, a burden? They'd get hungry for the things of God because they hadn't seen it in a while. And people go back and they'd study it, but what's the way that God said to do it? And they'd get everything lined up. What happened when Solomon dedicated the new temple? God showed up and nobody else could go into God's house except God. That wasn't a tabernacle, that was the temple. That was God's house. You know what? The temple was meant to be permanent. That's why they built it so well. It would have been permanent if it wouldn't have been destroyed. Because Israel fell away from it. It's a whole different story. But you know what the tabernacle was meant for? It was meant as a temporary place. It was with them in the wilderness as they were traveling for 40 years waiting for that unbelieving and unfaithful generation to die off because they didn't believe that God was able to be their God be able to give unto them all that he promised to so that generation had to die out so he gave them a tabernacle that was a temporary place you know what this is it's just a temporary place but originally I wanted to teach him he's going to get to that and then the rest of the lesson was going to be dwelling with God or living with God in the abode the temporary place he didn't just promise that the Holy Ghost it, we he says our Right? We will come unto him and make our abode with him. Jesus promised that he'd never leave you nor forsake you. He promised that he was a friend that sticketh closer than a brother. He promised that everything you went through, he's already been through it and tasted it before, and he came out on the other side perfect. One is your example, but two, so that he could succor you, or in other words, help you, edify you, support you, so that you could get through it. Because he knew how to get through it. If you know how to do something, you can help anybody do it. But he says, I'm God. If I figured it out, surely I can make you into what you need to be to overcome it or do for you what you can't do for yourself. He says, I've come here to be with you. He promised he would be. 
He said the comforter's coming, but here in this verse he also says, but guess who's, big? you know, he says, not going to manifest where the world can see me. That was everybody else. But he says, I'll be manifest unto you, those that love him. Why? Because every day you get in this book, you see him. Every time you put on a song, you start hearing about him. Every step that you take, even though you can't see him, he's close. He's close enough that when he comes, he's going to holler, come up hither. Right, there's going to be a voice of an archangel. Well, in the Old Testament, they called him the angel of the Lord. Who do you think shouting? Jesus. They're saying, hey, get up here. Guess what's going to happen? Those that are dead in Christ, their body's going up first. They need a little bit of extra changing room. Guess what's happening to us? We which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them. And so shall we ever be with Christ. He's close enough that when he hollers, you're going to hear him. So how close do you think he is every day when you're walking? Well, he should be one step right in front of you. Because the instruction was to follow him. But he promised not only would he be in front of you, that he'd be beside you. How do you think that could be possible? If it wasn't for the Son and the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost is a part of you. It's not just beside you. It's in here. It's down in here. But then he also said that he'd be above you because the Bible tells us to look unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. I don't believe that's talking about right in front of me. It's saying look to Jesus because where's he at? Seated on the right hand of the Father. But guess where else he is? He's right there. Right in front of me. He's right next to me. He's where I'm headed. He's where I've already been. He's all places. But he said that they would come and make their abode with you. He wasn't talking about just him. He said our. When you really start to realize that God intended you to live so much higher than the benefits that you afford as a Christian, God intended for the manifest presence of God to be evident in your life. He wanted the Holy Ghost to be so real that when you sat down to read the Bible, it was as if the very voice of God was reading it to you in your heart. He wanted it to be so real that when you got in here and you read the promises that you truly believed that the God of heaven wrote that just for you. And to be convinced of it by the Holy Ghost. He wanted you to be so convinced that the Holy Ghost took your prayers to heaven that there was no doubt that your prayers weren't read right before the very throne room of or the throne of God in the throne room of heaven. That our high priest, Jesus, seated at the right hand of the Father, ever making intercession for us. You know why he's always praying? Because he's right here in front of us and he's saying, Lord, help him follow me. Help him be one of your children. Do unto, or do for them what only we can, because we promise to meet all their needs. Truly, I believe that you don't need to pray for your needs, but I believe that you should because you don't expect it from God. I also believe you should thank Him for it, but He promised He's already going to meet it. He said, Ask and you shall receive, seek and you shall find. He already promised that He is going to provide it. You shouldn't be asking or seeking for what you need because God promised to give it. What's He talking about asking and seeking? He's talking about following and keeping those commandments that He gave us. You got a thing that in your life that's keeping you from keeping those commandments? Preventing you from doing He says, ask and you shall receive what you need to overcome it. Seek and you shall find the answer that you need to pin this flesh back down to that cross that you're carrying with you. Right? He says, knock and the door that needs to be open will be open. But he says, you ask and you don't receive. You seek and you don't find it. And you knock and the door stays closed. Why? It's because you ask that you may, cons may consume it upon your own lust. The best life you can have is when you set you on the shelf and you say, Lord, I just want to keep what you gave us. Everything that I need, you already gave me. So, Lord, just help me keep it. If you enjoyed today's message, head on over to ibcflorence.com and click on sermons. And don't forget to check out our other links in the notes section of today's broadcast. As always, thanks for listening.